Welcome to the SEAM Podcast. And today I am really excited to interview Bridget Burke Brown, who is the founder of the Beyond Beauty Project. It's like a lot of bees there. Um, and oh, I know. <laughs> on purpose, I was saying the alliteration's on purpose, but I'm really excited. Everything you do is very near and dear to my heart, and your life story is so interesting. And clearly, you've seen the the depths of, of darkness and I don't know, become, you're such an incredibly positive person and spokeswoman. And I think it's, it's very admirable, especially if you mm. really dig in and, and I want to talk to you about it, but I've just read a bit about like your life history and, and whatnot. Um, so let's start with just, you're from outside of Detroit, you're from Michigan, you were discovered yes. as a model um, I picture it as one of those moments where like, for real, like, I mean, obviously you're gorgeous, but you're, you know, discovered. And then before you knew it, you were hightailing it out of Michigan. So just sort of start from the beginning and, yep. and tell us how that all. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. First of all, I'm very excited to chat with you today. Yeah. So I actually didn't get discovered. What happened was I was, so my mom was really sick growing up. So my Dad was the primary, you know, income for our household. I have four other siblings and he was working like 70 hours a week. So when I went to college, I was helping pay for my college and I was going to college full time. I somehow got a job as a secretary at Big Boy Headquarters to the vice president of purchasing. Didn't know how to type, but got that job. So I was working full time. I started, it was the first time I was really making money. And growing up, my mo- uh, my dance teacher and people would say like, you should model, you should model. And I had no interest in it. It was the first time that I really f- got the feeling of what it felt like to make money. And I had remembered, oh, you know, my mo- my dance teacher, people would tell me like, you should model. The thought made me super uncomfortable. Um, I never wanted to do it, but I was like, well, maybe I could just make like an extra $100 a month modeling, you know, why not try? So I found the best photographer in town. I met him. We took photos and he was like, you could do this. You could travel. We should send your pictures out. So I'm working at Big Boy headquarters as a secretary. We send out all these like packages, like handwritten letters with pictures and like all over the world. And I remember I came back in on a Monday And my boss just handed me a stack of faxes. It was one of my faxed. (laughs) And he was like, so I guess you're not going to be working here much longer. And I was like, what? I'm like, um, I don't know. (laughs) And then I just, I mean, I had faxes from Australia, Paris, New York, everywhere. And I, next thing I knew I was on a plane and my life changed. And why were you hesitant to go down that road? Like what made you at, at, how old were you at this point? 20 something or? Um, okay. I was 19 when I started, but I think the hesitation came from partly maybe my personality. Um, I can be very outgoing, but I'm more, I think I just figured this out recently and it made so much sense to like so much like social anxiety that I'm actually an introvert. And I don't know. I think there was this subconscious part of me that didn't like the judgment about the way we looked. I think that I did probably grow up like, I'm sure we'll get into the beauty ideal, but like a little girl that grew up looking like the beauty ideal. And I probably got comments and I think I probably internalized them. I'm kind of unpacking this now with my project, right? Um, and I didn't like it made me uncomfortable. And then as I like, you know, went on in my modeling career and then now started my project, it all sort of like came full circle and it made sense to me that I just, it's not right. You know? Yeah. We're more than what we look like. Yeah, definitely. So then you were a professional model traveling the world and booking I'm, I'm assuming print or mo- runway, like everything. Yeah, I was doing like when I was younger, I did a little runway. I'm not as like tall or I was never as thin as I needed to be um, for runway, but I, I had a very good career in prints. 
So when I was younger, I was doing like Australian Vogue and Korean Vogue. And, um, and then as I got a little bit more mature, I was doing a lot of sort of like lands end and more lifestyle-y kind of catalogs. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, I had a great career. I'm like super, I'm super grateful for my modeling career. I have wonderful friends and it gave me this life I would have never had otherwise. Um, and also it did lead me to where I am now and sort of fighting, you know, harmful beauty ideals and, um, you know, representation for all of us. So yeah, it's, um, it's a good thing in the ending, but I definitely learned that, you know, beauty is more than skin deep and, or goes deeper than, you know, what we look like on the outside. And I think that was a common theme throughout my career. I would sort of go in and out of really enjoying it because, you know, as soon as you're told, Oh, you need to lose weight or you need to cut your hair. Something's not perfect about you. It's like, I always had this feeling of like, no, but I have like things to say and I have, and I'm smart and I have, you know, like I was always a bit of like a rebel about it. It always irritated me maybe more than some of the other girls. And then, I mean, I feel like this was a few years ago. You don't look much older than 20 or 19 right now, but (laughs) (laughs) I feel like it's so much more intense now not just for, you know, women who are modeling, but just in general and life and girls growing up, honestly, guy, boys too. And, mm-hmm. you know, how to figure out how to understand what you're, you're saying now, which is that, you know, beauty and the ideals of beauty and the way we see ourselves has to be more than just, you know, the exterior. Um, but in this day and age with every single thing that our I don't want to say our kids, like young people, grownups do is so focused on, you know, putting this perfect image out into the world, airbrushing your own photos. I mean, you know, I grew up when we Polaroids were a really big deal or you took your, your, your film to this. I don't even have CVS in LA to wherever photo stopper, you know, and then you got all your pictures and you realized half of them were terrible, you know, like basically of someone's foot, (laughs) you know, and then the other half and you were upset because you spent 15 bucks on the film and getting it developed. And, but there was no, absolutely no, like, Oh, I'm going to fix it. (laughs) You know, I'm going to fix the face. And now it's, it's so prevalent. And that coupled with, the amount of makeup that young women and men wear actually is unbelievable. I was talking about this with a friend of mine whose daughter is 17 and, and we were not, she doesn't wear barely any, she barely wears any makeup. Um, and her daughter wears, you know, everything sits on the YouTube and has tutorials on how to contour and do all she's, I'm just stunning young teenage girl with perfect skin. Um, and the idea that she's putting all this on her face is just bananas to me and her own mom, but it's what they do. And so I feel like it's, you know, you're, what you're talking about is so relevant and so important. So how do you see that in terms of like how you started, you had that nervous energy about modeling in the first place because of that. And now I feel like it's just, you know, a volcano of, of this disconnect yeah. between outer and inner beauty. I mean, how do you talk about it? And how do you talk about it to young women and and get that message across? Yeah. So, yeah. So just to start with the problem and then we'll go into some of the solutions. Like when I started modeling, it's interesting. We had the Polaroids and we had the film and you had to like make the picture perfect in the Polaroid before you started using the film because you couldn't retouch. And then I remember when retouching came in, they would like swap our legs and like, it was wild. They don't do that as much anymore, but I'll get asked a lot. Do you think, you know, the body diversity movement or the body positivity movements are helping And I think that they are in the way that young girls are seeing themselves in advertising more. So if there's a black girl or a girl in a bigger body, like she's able to see herself represented in media, which is great. The problem is I almost think we're going in this other direction and it's getting really bad because of what you said. There's like, not only are advertisers retouching now, 
kids are retouching their own images. So advertisers used to share it to all of us. Now, kids, even parents, moms are retouching their photos and they're advertising themselves around to their networks. So every time you get an image, you're thinking, wow, you know, my friend's skin is perfect. Oh, wow. She looks so thin. My skin's not perfect. I'm not that thin. So I think one of the things we can start doing is we all have to collectively think of the messaging we're putting out there. I think that there's a huge responsibility in the people that have power or are in a position of influence, like beauty brands, fashion brands, influencers, celebrities, etc. But I think that we also have a lot of influence over the people in our life, like in our circle. They say like the people you hang out with, you become, right? And I think trying to stop filtering, like really trying to stop filtering, especially if you have your, you know, you have younger sisters or your mom and you're filtering, you know? And then I just read a stat that plastic surgery, I think since 2000, I'm not exactly sure on this, but I think it's since 2017 has went up 583% for women. And then for men, it's like 300. Yeah. It's like 300 and something for men. So that's where I think the issue is. Now we have all these tools to either retouch the images or actually like retouch our face like physically, like actually change it, you know? So I think it's really having these conversations and continuing to educate and know that like, it's not real, like these images. So I do a lot of workshops with teens and preteens. And we talk a lot about like, I'll put an image that's not retouched and then a retouched image and sort of like, you know, the messaging that goes out to these girls all the time is, you can be better. You can be more perfect. You can be better. You should have flawless skin. You should have no cellulite. So it's like if we can continue to do little things at home to share those messages, but then also ask the beauty brands, like, please, please start showing reality because it's really harming our youth. It's harming Um, it's harming all of us, but like, I really want to focus on our youth because I think that's where we can make change. And like the eating disorder rates are going up. The mental health is going in the tank. So I think it's really seeing like, what's my power. And that's one of the reasons why I walked away from the modeling industry when I did, because I had went through this really kind of rock bottom in my life. I had lost my mom, my dad, my brother, a best friend, like within two years It was just, and it was all really like horrific um, deaths, really. And I had my daughter, I was six months pregnant with her at my dad's funeral. He was the the final one to pass. And then I had this series of miscarriages. And before I had my daughter, I was at the height of like my sort of uh, commercial modeling career with like the Land's End and stuff. And my final miscarriage was twins at five and a half months. And I was broken. I mean, I was suicidal. I was like, I was not okay. I was not okay on any level. I lost everything. You know, I felt like I lost mental health, my family, now my body. And I was really working. I was like, if I can just get my career back, I'll just get my career back. And then I'm going to be okay, you know? And I remember I went, and I say this story a lot and I feel bad because I know people in the industry are just like sort of doing their job and they're really like in it. They're in it, you know? But I was, went to work. I'm 41, 42, not to work. Sorry. I went to my agency, which was Ford Models at the time. And um, the first thing they said was like, you have to lose weight. And I wasn't big. And I just thought, no, I am a person of influence. I influence my daughter. I influence my nieces that see me in advertisements. I'm not going to shrink myself. I'm not going to say when I'm smaller than I'm worthy. And I'm like, I know that I'm not somebody big. I'm not a supermodel. I'm not, you know, somebody that everybody knows, but I do have influence. And I can be one person out of many that starts to say no. And that was, and it makes me emotional, like even talking about it, because I'm like, if we all start taking little steps to 
say, no, you can't tell me I'm not allowed to age. I'm allowed to age. I'm allowed to be exactly who I am in this body right now. And I'm beautiful just the way I am, you know? So I think it starts with the messaging at home. It starts with educating our children on the media is not true. It's those influencers that have the guts to say, this is what I actually look like. This is what I look like without all the makeup, the retouching, the filtering. And I'm great. I'm good. Just the way I am. Yeah. So I think it's a collective shift. And I think these conversations are helping everybody sort of, it's, you got to change the mentality. We get messaged all day long. It's hard to think outside of that box. It's not easy to. So it's also the willingness to. Yeah. I mean, I think it starts at home so much. I think it's monitoring your kids intake of what they, you know, we monitor what our kids eat. You know, we try to at least West starting when they're infants, right. And you monitor their surroundings and what toys they play with, what books they read. And so I think it, there's something that's happened where we sort of like, once your kid gets their phone you're like, uh, you know, go for it. Yeah. Um, but sort of monitoring that in a healthy way. And then teaching them about, like you said, like what's real, what's not real, what's healthy, what's not healthy, and just how they can see themselves for who they really are and accept themselves, which is so hard to do when you're a, you know, a hormone filled preteen and teenager. My kids range from 20. So I I have, you know, a, a pretty good range, but of watching it, go them go through it and puberty and pre puberty. And I mean, it's just all a mess, but but their yeah. self-esteem is it's a hard time. so low anyways, you know, it just like is because you're, you're out of control of your body and you don't know what's up from down. So this idea that we can arm our kids and young people or family members or people in your community, or like you said, in your sort of circle about how to see what's real, like you said. And, yeah. and I think, you know, and what I do is really with women's health and preventive care, and in my opinion, this falls right into it. But my saying is know you're normal, right? So women mm. at all different stages in your life, you have to know what your normal is. And then if you're outside that norm, you know, who to speak to and when to speak up and to figure out what is potentially wrong. So big things, you know, we yeah. think about, you know, your your period's really different or your bowel movement's really different or your breasts feel really different or your area and your, you know, lower mid stomach feel really different. That's when you think I am totally out of my normal. I need to say something, but I do think it translates yeah. into maybe normal is not the right word, but who are you inside and who are you? And then having kids and then grown people hold on to that and, and understand like, this is me, this is my base and I'm good with it. <laughs> And I, and I, you're going to take yeah. the time to, to, to understand it and understand what your body type is, you know, and what your body can do and can't do and what your skin can do and can do what your hair should be doing on its own and what you're doing to try and make it look like mm-hmm. something else and, you know, ripping out its natural beauty and then probably ruining it for your whole life. You know, those are really important messages that are really hard to get across. So I, I, I think I know. it's having the conversations I, and being willing to have them. Yeah, I think celebrating your uniqueness or like your natural beauty, like you said, is really cool too. Like if we could make that a little bit more cool. And I think with our bodies in particular, it's like normalizing that bodies change and they're supposed yeah. to change. Like, you know, before you start your period, you put on a little weight because your body is doing this beautiful thing that it's supposed to do. It's prepping for your menstrual cycle. And after, you know, and when you have babies and after you have babies, but in our society, we're so brainwashed that we're supposed to look like a 12 year old girl forever, basically. And it's like, so I think it's really normalizing and owning that like, I'm this size and I'm supposed to be and my body's healthy and it's doing what it's supposed to do. And it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, I, so normalizing that a bit in yeah. the social circles, in the bigger realms, you know, and that's where those sort of like body positivity or body diversity is helping a bit, I think. But 
you know, we still all are still striving for the beauty ideal at the end of the day. We have a ways to break that thing down. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I live in Los Angeles and one of my dearest friends lives um, in the Middle East and she spends a good portion of her time in LA with me in the summer. And she's always like, women don't look like this. (laughs) Women around the world don't look like the 40 something year old women that we are seeing Mm -hmm. in our workout studio in the mornings. Like it's totally crazy that all these women look like this. They're clearly not eating. They're working out insane amounts of, you know, hours in their day who has the time. And like, it is, it's just not, it is so not a representation of women around the world. It's sort of crazy. And these are women who are, you know, in pockets all over the U S or all over the world who, you know, post themselves at this stage in my life and look what I look like. And, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of going against nature, which is really tricky. And and like I said, I have three boys, but you know, each of them now I'm with my youngest who's in the phase right now where it's like your body hoards on to the fat for that first big growth spurt. And to me, it's like, you know, when you're pregnant and you're going to breastfeed, your body's just like hoarding it so that you can pr- produce food to feed your child. Like there's nothing more in- incredibly, you know, mind blowing than that. But for a 13 year old boy, who's always been, you know, this like tiny little muscle ball of, you know, abs and whatever, all of a sudden he looks down and he's like, what is happening to my body? Yeah. It's not like his lifestyle changed. And I'm just, and he, I, I and his brothers say, dude, this is what you want to happen. Like, if you want to grow, this is what your body's going to do. Like, just deal with yep. it. You know, it is what it is. But it's, you know, it's really kind of shocking. And and he's, you know, not even on like social, he doesn't have Instagram or anything like that. But 13 year old girls do. And it's, you know, it's really hard. And like you said, it's, well, your body's preparing to to go through puberty. Like there are so many changes that are going to happen. And, you know, that's just, it's all these different moments in your life when your body does change as women, when our hips grow or we hoard on to fat in different parts of our body than at 47 that I am, than I did at 27, you know, but it's, yeah, it's being okay with it. I also feel there's also this this line of being healthy. And so I think there's, it's important for us to be body positive and to recognize that everyone comes in different shapes, colors, and sizes, but also recognizing what it means to be healthy. And I do think that's Mm -hmm. a really tricky thing to define and our society is doing a really poor job of that right now. So do you address that with, with um, young people that you talk to? Like, what does being healthy mean? I think that that's maybe relative. There's definitely different, different definitions of that. And I think some of that is where you are with your, I guess, where you are mentally with how you eat or how you work out, you know, I think being healthy is feeling good. So how do I feel the best? I feel the best when I'm not too restrictive. I feel the best when I give myself a lot of vegetables and water and hydration. I need a lot of sleep. Um, I need a sweaty workout. I need some like easier workouts So I think it's very personal to each person. And I think that we live in a society that has taught us to look at ourselves either through the mirror, you know, look at our weight on a scale, look at our image on a phone. We need to get back inside and really get in tune with how am I feeling? What does my body need? Mm -hmm. You know, like, do I need to just walk outside and walk barefoot in the grass for a second just to like, calm my nervous system. We're so far away from that. We're sort of like fake being healthy. Like, let me go do a soul cycle and then sort in here and let me get my green juice. And, you know, and are you really healthy? I don't know. You know, you might, that's the thing is you can look at someone and think, oh, they're thin. You know, that's what society tells me is healthy. But are they, you know, 
what's our mental health? So I think it's looking at your mind, body, and spirit Mm -hmm. together. Like, how is everything feeling? Um, That would be my definition of healthy. I think that maybe, and I'm curious your thoughts because you have older children than me. Like, do you think that helping our children know that they're so much more than their beauty, they're so much more than their bodies, and just really kind of say like, hey, like cherish those, like work on those things that make you unique or you're really good at or you want to get better at and make those more important in your life. Do you think that would help our kids? I do. I think it's, I think everyone has their superpower, you know, Um, it can be being a good listener. It can be that you love to read. It can be that you're a fantastic water polo player. It can be so many different things. So I think it's it's helping our kids and the kids of the world, you know, find that and and find it and know that it can change, you know, that know that you grow and you change, mm-hmm. your body grows and changes. So what you love doing when you were a toddler or a preteen or a teen make really different than your 20s. Like what and I think that's part of growing and evolving. I can tell you my my superpowers are really different in my late 40s than they were in my 20s. Um yeah. But I mm-hmm. think honing in on that and and so really encouraging that sort of soul searching and the superpower I think you have is is exactly kind of what you're saying that is your definition of healthy. I think that's when you're like tapped into it, that's when you feel really good, you know? When yeah. you feel like mm-hmm. you're healthy, you feel productive, you feel in sync your body, your mind, your soul, you feel really awake. And I think that we all naturally have times that sometimes can last a long time or sometimes are just moments where you're the opposite of that. You know, you're really tired or you feel funny. You know, you're eating things that don't make you feel good. And sometimes you do it to sport. Sometimes you do it just because you're just doing it. And, or you, you haven't even gone for a walk in a while. Um, big problem during COVID for a lot of our kids when they just sort of lost this connection to what was going on outside their home and they could do those activities. So I think getting back to that and encouraging them and also ourselves, right? So you had that moment where you were wanting to go back into your career and then, you know, we're told you had to change in order to do that. And, and good for you. You were said, no, like I'm, I can't do, I'm not doing that or I'm not doing that anymore. Like I I'm now at the point in my yeah. life where I know that's not what I want for myself and I won't feel good about myself if I go down that road. So I think, you know, that moment where that was your superpower, you were so in touch with what was going to make you feel good and healthy that you made a choice to stay on the right road. And so I think giving our kids the tools to make those choices, knowing they're going to make tons of bad choices because their kids totally. and their <laughs> all those things. but but hopefully the, yep. the soul choices are right and good and you know I'll give you an example my my oldest son is away this summer and having an incredible experience and he he called me the other night really drunk and he's of age and all that but I talked to him the next day and I was like you know like, I don't know how often you're drinking like that. I hope not very much. And he's like, no, it was someone's birthday. I said, but it's not healthy. Like, you don't feel good today, do you? And he said, no, I don't. I said, okay, then, you know, I understand splurging and I understand going out and having fun. I understand it's age appropriate. Do it now, not when you're, you know, old, older. But but really try and make choices that feel good for you so that mm-hmm. you feel good about decisions that you made. I don't want you... To uh, wake yeah. up, you know, that next morning, that next day and be like, oh, that was, I shouldn't have done that. Now we all do that, of course, but as you get older, I think it's important for us and to teach our kids to have some foresight, right? Have some foresight into yep. you know, making good decisions. And they have this horrible added weight of everything they do is being recorded. <laughs> everything they do yeah. is being photographed and posted and recorded and posted and nothing happens unless you show it to everybody. So their wiggle room to make mistakes is really small. And 
Mm. That stays with you forever. I just talked to a friend who was like, we were talking about, she has a younger child about, you know, what do you tell your kids about the internet? And I said, well, that nothing goes away. (laughs) You can't delete anything. Yeah. So totally. That's such a pressure, right? It's the pressure on both sides. It's the pressure to put out this perfect view of yourself, your family, or, you know, what you look like or where you're vacationing, but also to really hone in on, you know, what do I, what makes me feel good? And what am I focusing, you know, at least 95% of my time on doing those sort of positive things that make me feel really like I've tapped into that superpower. So I think that's important. And then, you know, the discussion of, of real health, of making decisions that don't, that you're not going to end up, you know, in the hospital, or you're not going to end up really doing harm to yourself physically and mentally, I think is, it's just conversations we, we can't be afraid to have, you know, you just can't. Yeah, absolutely. I also think some of it, it's like making your own rules, like, or not thinking you have to follow all the rules because there's a lot of sort of society rules telling us that we have to look or act or be a certain way. And like, you know, if you don't feel good, if you're going to a party and drinking that much, you don't have to do it. So it's like, I think it's guiding them probably to stand like confident in being their own person, right? Whether it's, they don't have to post on social media or they don't have to drink or they don't have to be a size zero, you know, like they can be how they feel the best, like how, like check in, ask themselves and then do that. That's the best guidance. A hundred percent. Yeah. And you know, when you're feeling so out of control and you're feeling like life is moving so much faster at a, you know, faster clip than you're moving. Well, I think one of the first things that people can try to control is their, is what they eat, right? What they put into their body. Yeah. That sort of, I'm taking subconsciously for, especially for younger people, but I'm going to take back the control by deciding what I eat and what I don't eat. And and I think it's really dangerous. So I think it's, in addition, reminding people of all ages, especially young people, that they can gain back control in other ways too, um, that are more, yeah. you know, will be healthier decisions. That's a great way to say it. I love that. You can gain back control in other ways and you can. You can, you know. Think Just sitting and journaling. You can, right? And I think the younger that we teach especially women I'll focus on right now that, you know, how to understand their bodies, how to feel comfortable with their bodies, how to be in touch with the, the changes that are constantly happening in our bodies. You know, those are, those are real, real important tools to give them when they're younger that they'll carry through their whole lives. I mean, you know, the number of women that I've met, yeah, that, you know, had significant changes in their bodies but never had the time or, you know, person encouraging them to understand their body. So not only yeah. did they ignore those changes, they sometimes weren't even aware that they were really yep. changes and had, you know, then turned into horrible, horrible life-threatening illnesses, diseases. Now that's pretty extreme, but that is, but. you know, what it is. And so I think it's, you know, it's really honing in on that, that we all need these. This is what we were born with. Like, this is what we got. So, you know, yeah. find it, understand it, and be good with it. I think that's really interesting because I think that I keep talking about the rules and how we're like taught to look outside of ourselves. We were taught that so much that we're not just getting in tune or learning our bodies. And we're also not taught that. Like, there's not even enough education or I guess content out there on menopause. Like all of my friends right now are going through perimenopause and they're like, what's going on? I think I like have something, you know, Uh and they go down a rabbit hole and I'm like, I'm kind of a little bit ahead of them. But I think when our children are younger and what I'm trying to do with my daughter now, we'll see what it does. But like, if she's like, we're talking about hangry a lot right now. And so once we get unhangry and we can have a conversation, I talk to her and I say, okay, your body needed fuel. It needed good food or maybe she had 
just sugar. And then she's like having a sugar breakdown, you know? So like we, this is a good story. So we went to the Rockets. She got a, she had had like a dessert or something already. She got a cotton candy. She wanted it. She wanted it. So I said, just have half of it. I think your body is not going to appreciate the entire thing. <laughs> Look over before I know it, she eat the whole thing. She looks at me like about two minutes later and she goes, mom, I don't feel good. <laughs> like, I feel like I'm going to throw up. I'm like, yeah, that's because you ate all the sugar. That's what happens. Like, that's how your body feels. So she was grumpy. Like, and so I'm trying to connect almost the emotions that we have from what's going on physically in our body for her. Yeah. So just to help her learn or, you know, she had a little you know, some stomach issues, we'll just say <laughs> uh, recently. <Don't> worry. <laughs> yeah. And like, as they all do and we all do. And so I'm really connecting like, okay, so wh- what we put in our body, how much water we drink, how we move our body, how much you're sleeping, that all affecting that part of your system. But it's really connected then to your mental health too, right? So yeah. like the hangry or you know, we, as adults, if we drink too much caffeine or a little bit jittery and an edge and it, you know, it, it's all connected. So I think we really need to like learn about our body. I wish they taught it more in school. I almost wish there was like half of school that happens now. And then the other half of school Man. was like bodies and mental health and emotional health. And because that's the stuff we really learn. And if we're not finding ways to teach our children, they're sort of self-educating themselves with social media or what their friends are doing. So it's like, hey, let me tell you this, or let me try to help you understand this better, or if they need to go to therapy or whatever it is that will help them that you have the resources for. Not everyone has all the resources, do all those things, but they can from there get in tune, listen to their bodies and make their own rules, you know? It's like we kind of have to guide our own path, I think, with this. Otherwise, we'll just be trying to keep up with something that's not realistic. A hundred percent. Falling in all the traps. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think it's you know one of my my oldest son actually had also had real gastro issues, and I um, after seeing doctors, he did a consultation with a holistic nutritionist, and the first thing she asked him was, "How much sleep do you get?" how much water, you know, what's your height? Yeah. And the first thing she added into his diet was like a hydration powder, you know, like you, you are, you need to hydrate every morning. First thing when you wake up, that's like an explained why Uh. the lack of nutrients in our food, you know, all these things. And, and it just doing that and adding that in has been a significant change for him. And, you know, and, and the importance of, not sleep from 2 a.m. to, you know, 11 a.m., but like actual sleep on a proper circadian, to get your body a proper circadian rhythm. Yeah, totally. And, you know, it changes everything about, you know, how you feel and your ability to do things during the waking hours. And it's sometimes they have to hear that from someone who's not their parent. Um, yep. So I agree. I think having, you know, gosh, if we could overhaul our education system in the U S you know, a bunch of really educated moms. I think it would be really a, I know. a windfall, it would be but, amazing. Yeah, but if, you know, until that happens, the influence you can have are in your kid's school and then also, you know, your home life and what you do. I think those are the things that are really, really beneficial knowing that no one's perfect all the time, but, but, you know, knowing now your daughter hopefully knows that if she shovels all that cotton candy, which probably was bigger than her head, you know, into her body in five seconds, she's going to want to throw up because her body's like, I can't yep. take this between the sugar and the food coloring and all that disgustingness. But knowing yeah. you can't, you know, completely say, absolutely not. You can't have that. It's so bad for you because then she'll go off to a friend's house and have it anyways. But Totally. Yeah. And you should enjoy some of it. Of course. You know, but knowing that you're sometimes they have to learn it on their own. And then as a parent, you're helping them, you know, make decisions, not that you think are right, but that her body tells her that are right and wrong. And yeah, and that's, you know, the younger that, that you can do that, you know, boy, the better off that, that they'll be for real. And that's so hard to do. Yeah, This is really important. 
Yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I wish I learned a lot of that when I was younger. I feel like I didn't start learning about my body till I was... That was one of the blessings about modeling is I had to stay a certain size and stuff. So I was, you know, and I'm a researcher and I like to learn. So I was starting just to read all these books and then I ended up getting my holistic health coaching. So I was like, I'm going to do this in a healthy way if because it wasn't sustainable how I was trying to do it. I was trying to be like Kate Moss and smoke cigarettes and starve my, you know, and I, I was really bad at starving myself. So <laughs> like, well, I'm not doing that. Um, so I was like, all right, well, I guess if I'm going to do this, I need to learn it a healthy way. But I remember even as I started learning, I was like, God, if I would have known all this when I was younger, you know, they don't teach us this stuff. So right. yeah, any way we can kind of like trickle in a little education for the kids or, you know, I want to create an after school program. I think it would yeah. be so cool to just go to like be able to go to an after school program, learn that our bodies are supposed to change and, you know, what's going on physically can affect us mentally. What's going on mentally can help, you know, affect us physically. What is healthy foods? Why do foods with food coloring make me feel kind of bad? Or why do I feel a little weird after I eat that? And well, how can I reset if I'm not feeling good? And making like your own little toolbox sort of, yeah. because that's what you really need. You know, like if I'm physically exhausted, I'm mentally exhausted. I go, that goes hand in hand for me, probably for a lot of us. If I'm physically tired, I'm an emotional disaster. <laughs> and um, so I have to say, okay, what's, what's in your toolkit? And my toolkit is you got to get a couple nights of really good sleep. You need to drink a lot of water you need to eat some healthy food, whatever your body feels healthy with. And I usually have to slow down a little bit. So within my slowing down, like, do I need a journal? Do I need to do a therapy appointment? Do I just need to hug my dog and sit on the couch and binge watch some horrible TV? You know, like, yeah. what is it that's going to make me feel better? I don't know. I just think all the ways we can sort of like, hey, here's a little messaging for this to, you know, like was, I liked what you said to your son. Like, did that make you feel good? Yeah. No. Like, if I drink a couple of Gatorades that day. Yeah. I hope so. I hope so. <gasps> no, I think you should. I think you should create a manual where you have topics and it could be some sort of extracurricular activity and yeah, do something really fantastic. Have you know, webinars on age groups from all over the country, log on, it'd be really cool. Yeah. I already have some workshops created and I've done a, quite a few workshops, but kind of doing it in a, like, I don't know, spreading it throughout the US somehow could be really cool. It'd be awesome. Just, uh, I think they would like it. I think the, I think both boys and girls, but I just know like, when my body was changing, I would have liked to, like, I wasn't going to go to my mom. Like a lot of, like, I'm hoping my daughter will come to me because I already, we're always already talking about stuff, but I think it would just be nice to have this other place. Even if you can talk to your mom, just this other place, like you said, sometimes it's good to hear it from, or they need to hear it from somebody that's not their mom. Like my girlfriend has a 12 nine but anyways the 12 year old specifically she'll always say can you tell her that because i've told her that she's not gonna listen to me and then i'll be like you know try to add it in but yeah it's true i i remember my mom would be like if one day you're gonna know that you should have listened to me <laughs> so i'm sure that's coming for me soon yeah but then you know with it with their peers around them and and then able to sort of chat about it i think is would be a really good yeah. experience and would be really helpful and beneficial. There's the second puberty that's like starting to get a little bit of traction. The college girls are starting to learn about that mm -hmm. is also a time where your body's shifting, it's gaining weight and they don't understand because they're like, oh, I've always been, if they've always been really, whatever their body's always been like, it's yeah. changing. They think a lot of times it's, it can be like the college 15 or whatever it is, but it's also at a similar time of when your body is sort of having this second puberty and it's kind of, it's kind of prepping for like, okay, you're going to maybe have some babies soon, which yeah. you know, people aren't having babies that young so much anymore, but it's a natural thing that our body's going through. And instead 
the media tells us it's not. So it's very confusing too. So I think it's education. Yeah. And it's happening for most right when they're leaving home for the very first time. And so they're not making yes. the decision. They're making decisions they never had to make. Right. I mean, I mean, it happened to me. So I was every day being like, well, what do I have for dinner? You know, and, and, and making <laughs> How do I cook? decisions. Yeah. <laughs> And I remember at one point a friend of mine said, you know, remember at home you have like a salad and then you have, you know, the main course. And now you're like just eating a salad. I thought, you know, eating my giant salad with tuna in it was good, but it was, wasn't because then I was starving later and my body's also changing. And so it's just this, this sweet spot, especially for girls who are, you know, you're just at this moment where you're away from home, all your norms are out the window, you're sleeping at terrible times, you're doing things you would not have done before. And your body is like, uh, I'm going to hang on to some of this stuff you're putting in. And so yeah, it all yeah. kind of in a free fall. It is, it is a great conversation to have that I, I agree with you. It's yeah. not being had in the right way. Another thing about bodies that I think isn't taught enough is like, some days you're going to be really hungry. Some days you're not going to be really hungry because we're told you eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, or you eat three small meals at five small meals a day or whatever you believe, whatever diet sort of thing that you've kind of latched onto or your mom latched onto the past on to you. But really like even my dog, my dog will eat a ton for a couple of days. And then there's a couple of days where I'm like, are you sick? Something wrong yeah. with you? no just not that hungry, you know? And then when we start going through puberty and getting our period and all the second puberty during our cycles, we're hungry, more hungry, and that's okay. And women can gain up to eight to 10 pounds of water weight just during, you know, their cycle of their period. And that's also okay. So it's like a lot of educating, I think, and just understanding it's okay. And it's going to go back to my normal, like you mentioned in the beginning. Yeah. It's going to go back to my normal. If it doesn't go back to my normal, then maybe I can deep dive a little bit more. Yeah. Like, do I need to kind of look at what, how have I been treating myself or do I need to take it further to a doctor or something, you yeah. know? So yeah, definitely. Yeah. A hundred percent. And that, you know, and maybe it's a new normal and you got to sort of figure that out. And Yep. Listening to your body during those those moments, those times, if you know if you're really craving a burger, you might be low in iron, you know, or you're just your body wanting yes. and listening and saying, you know, I never drink a glass of milk, but I really want a glass of milk. Like something inside of you, yeah, saying, why the calcium? Like something's happening, and listening to that and honoring it um, in a healthy yeah. way, yeah, because your body talks to you all the time. Um, especially as all the time. I mean, you know, we literally live on a cycle and you got to listen to it and you're, you really need to understand like, you know, what it's saying and how to honor it and how to do it in a way where you feel good about that choice because your body will tell you, yeah, thank you. I needed that. Now, like I'm not, you know, my brain. Yeah. Or like, I really like, thank you for giving me a nap instead of forcing me to go for a run <laughs> because I actually really like if my body, I'm pretending like my body is talking right yeah. now, but it's like, you know, like I really needed that rest instead of forcing myself, you know? And then I also think it's learning, like, you know, if you're craving a lot of sugar all the time, okay, why? Yeah. Like you're kind of saying, like, if you want a glass of milk, like sometimes it's like, okay, cause I've eaten a ton of sugar for the last two weeks. So I got to kind of get myself off the sugar. I got to get my body more alkaline again. Cause yeah. it kind of, tipped over into, um, yeah. So there's a lot that I think, yeah. Yeah. Sugar's like more addictive it's little nuggets than, um, nicotine. I mean, it's cocaine. You know, yeah. Oh, nicotine. <laughs> Nicotine's the most. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I always call sugar for kids, like kitty cocaine. I'm like, it is. And your body, <laughs> like when they're little, little, like if you give them too much, they're like, <laughs> yeah. And then your body wants it all the time. I mean, it's really crazy. And when you cut it out mm -hmm. and you maybe just have some natural sugars, you don't want it anymore. It's really kind of fascinating. Like it is, it's really a drug and it's, you know, the, the sugars that we're eating that are so addictive aren't natural. They're not, they're like chemicals. Yeah. And so your, your body like wants it. It's like, you're, it's going it's like seeping in, in this 
really terrible way. Um, yeah, it's pretty scary. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Yeah. But anyways, we could talk forever. I'm really, really, really I know. enjoying the conversation. <laughs> I have one last question to ask you. Um, you touched on it a little bit. And if you don't want to go into it in a lot of depth, I understand. But how did you really deal and then get through that intense trauma um, that you experienced in your life when you had so much horrible loss during that span of, I guess, one to two years, you said. And what sort of has that taught yeah. you in your life? And what was sort of the life lesson that came out of it? I think that I got through it because I had my daughter. So I really had to get up and I had to be, you know, okay for somebody. Um, and I have a wonderful husband. So I think I was... I really call both of them my angels a lot because I'm like, they really, they, they kind of saved my life. But if you don't have that, let's say, I think that the other things I really, I was older, so I had done a good amount of therapy up to this point. So I knew that when I was really having like plans, I had a, I had a little while where I kind of had plans about when I felt suicidal. I knew I needed to tell somebody and I needed to tell somebody that wasn't my husband almost. So I told two of my friends and I know it sounds crazy, but I think just, just like, and I texted them and I was like, I don't want to talk about it. I'm just going to tell you. Cause I know I'm supposed to tell somebody and it really sort of like, Oh, like the, it's out of the box. Like I said it now, what am I going to do? It was all almost like I couldn't, they weren't going to let me get away with anything at that point. So then I was like, well, what am I going to do? Well, how, you know, and I just, I went to a psychiatrist. I saw my therapist regularly. Um, I went to a naturopath. I did all the things, you know, that I'm lucky that I can, I have the resources to do. And I think that there was a moment and I, I'm not really sure what triggered it, but where I was like, okay. I'm going to live, but if I'm going to live, how am I going to live? I'm going to live the way I want to live. Like, how do you want to live, Bridget? Like, what do you want to do? Like, what do you want to feel like? What do you want to do with the rest of your life? So I think I just kind of started. So my dad always used to say, like, little by little, Beatty called me Beatty, little by little, whenever I was like going through something. And I really would say I would wake up, I would feel like, I think a lot of people that have gone through significant loss knows this feeling. It's like, it's really heavy in the morning a lot. It's like, you almost like forget. And then as soon as you remember, it's like, oh, like the dread, you know, kind of comes over you. And I would just say, just one foot in front of the other, like little by little, one foot in front of the other. And and then I think I just slowly, I slowly got help. You know, my hormones were, I have, I went into, um, they sort of call it like trauma menopause, like early menopause, just from like the trauma that happened from losing the twins so late. Um, so I had a lot to sort out. Like when I finally got my results back from my naturopath, she's like, Whoa, how are you even surviving? I'm like, well, I barely am, but <laughs> I'm here. So I think I was always sort of resourceful. I tried to be resourceful. Like I maybe didn't want to do the thing, but I knew I needed to call the psychiatrist or I knew I needed to go to the doctor. So I just would take like one step in front of the other and keep going. I think what I learned from all of it is I think that we're so lucky to have our bodies. I think that I feel like I lost my health for a little boy at while. And I know it's nothing to, you know, my mom being bedridden or what my dad and my brother went through. But I think our bodies are, as Dr. Katie and Lexi Kite say, they're our instruments, right? And it's like, we have these bodies to you know, spend time with our family members or like life, life can be short. So I think it's taught me to also slow down a little bit. And believe me, it's a constant 
it's a constant like battle or something I'm constantly reminding myself of. But yeah, I think it's, I think those things, I try to slow down and really appreciate my health and take care of it, you know? Yeah. Well, I think you're incredibly inspirational and thank you so much for being so open and sharing so much of your story and your life and, you know, what you've been through and what you're doing is so magnificent and very powerful, very important. And I admire that. And if there's any way in the future we can do things together, I would love that. Because I, I love that. Yeah. I just think it's everything, you know, that we've talked about is just like honed right in, you know, it's like the sweet spot of, of what we can do to, you know, help make everyone who comes after us a little bit healthier and make good choices. Um, yeah. It doesn't just happen. It happens. Thank you. You know, really. Yeah. It just, it has, it happens consciously. It doesn't just sort of like, oh, everyone will figure it out. I was going to say that consciously. And I think that's where the education comes in and getting in tune, right? A hundred percent. So thanks so much Mm -hmm. for talking with me today. Thank you. It was so fun.